Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. On today's episode, we're going to learn about the movie Operation Finale. Operation Finale tells the story of how the Israeli Mossad officers captured former SS officer Adolf Eichmann in 1960. And right now, it's a great time to let you know that there might be some trigger words in here as we're talking about Nazis, the Holocaust, suicide, murder, and many of those horrible things that the Nazis did during World War II. Operation Finale was the debut screenplay from Matthew Orton and was directed by Chris Weitz, who was the writer behind Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, and also directed movies like The Golden Compass and New Moon from The Twilight Saga. When it was released in 2018, Operation Finale received mixed reviews and rather disappointing box office showing as it only earned back about $17.6 million of the $24 million budget that it took to make during its 11-week run in the box office. Now, how much of the story we saw in Operation Finale actually happened? I'm Dan LeFebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before starting our story today, there's two things we need to do. The first is to set up our game, two truths and a lie. Here's how it works. I'm about to give you three facts. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is an all-out lie. And your task throughout this episode is to find which one is the lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Adolf Eichmann's fake name at the time of his capture was Ricardo Clement. Number two, Klaus Eichmann dated a half-Jewish girl who helped in Adolf Eichmann's capture. Number three, Adolf Eichmann committed suicide in prison before he could be hanged. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, keep your ears peeled because somewhere throughout the episode I'll mention the two facts, and then by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Now, the last thing to do before getting into our story today is to get a quick recap of what we've covered on the producer's feed recently. Although, to be honest, it's been many months since we've done a recap of the producer's feed, so I don't think there would be enough time to really cover everything. We've talked about Oblivion, Jumanji, Castaway, Shrek, and the list goes on. As of this recording, there are over 50 minisodes and even more supplemental and bonus content that are all exclusive to the producer's feed. It's just my way of saying thank you for the awesome people like Tracy, whose kindness is helping me pay the bills around here and keep the lights on and keep podcasting for yet another episode. If you want to get access to the producer's feed, like Tracy, you can do what she did and head on over to baseonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's baseonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. All right, now it's time to begin our dive into the true story behind the movie Operation Finale. The movie opens with some text to set up the story. According to the movie, it's between 1939 and 1945 that the Nazis murdered over 10 million people they deemed to be enemies of the state, 6 million of them being European Jews. Some of the Nazi leaders, including Hitler, Himmler, and Goering, escaped justice by taking their own lives. A decade after the war ended, most people had forgotten about the head of the SS Office of Jewish Affairs, Adolf Eichmann. Since World War II itself is not the focus of the movie, it's probably not too surprising that this is a simplification of what happened during the war. But the broad strokes mentioned here are true. Let's start with the numbers given. You might have noticed the numbers given by the movie aren't very exact, which makes sense because we just don't know the exact number of people who lost their lives at the hands of the Nazis. Although it's worth pointing out that the movie mentions the years 1939 to 1945, which are the dates during World War II. That doesn't necessarily include the Nazi Party's rise to power in Germany itself, which would have been from the years 1933 to 1939. Well, I, I guess one could argue that they began the rise to power before 1933, since there was the whole Beer Hall push in 1923 that sent Hitler to prison, where he wrote Mein Kampf. But 1933 is when they took over power in Germany as the ruling party. Of course... Today, we know the mass murder by the Nazis as the Holocaust, a word coming from two Greek words, hollow meaning whole and kastos meaning burned. Most historians would agree with the number that the movie gave of over 10 million people targeted and murdered. 
with 6 million of them being Jews. Some would put that number even higher, at 11 million. So we don't really have exact numbers. And just like the movie implies, there were millions more beyond the Jews that were targeted and lost their lives during the Holocaust. You see, as they rose to power, the Nazis targeted anyone who opposed their political views. They targeted people who didn't fit their ideology. And while it is true that the Jews suffered some of the greatest losses during the Holocaust, they weren't the only group of people who were targeted for genocide by the Nazis. Roma, Slavs, ethnic Poles, homosexuals, black Germans, even smaller groups like Jehovah's Witnesses were murdered. As for the movie's mention of Hitler, Himmler, and Goring escaping justice by taking their own lives, that is also true. Being a fan of history, I'm sure you know that Adolf Hitler shot himself on April 30th, 1945, as the Third Reich was collapsing fast, and the Soviet army closed in on Berlin from the east and the Western Allies pushing through Germany from the west. He ordered his body and the body of Eva Braun to be burned. Eva was the woman Hitler had married in the late hours of the 28th or early morning hours of the 29th. Since Hitler and Braun's bodies were burned and buried after their deaths, well, we don't have them. We only know what happened from eyewitness statements from people who were in the bunker at the time. Now, as you can imagine, since we don't have Hitler's remains, there are plenty of conspiracy theories around Hitler's death, but we'll leave those alone for now. Those are stories for a different time. Heinrich Himmler also committed suicide, but in a different manner than Hitler. As the Third Reich was crumbling in early 1945, it became evident to some of Hitler's circle that Himmler wanted Hitler's job once Hitler was out of the picture, which seemed to be approaching fast by the way the war was going. So by the time the Soviet army had pushed their way near and into Berlin in April of 1945, Himmler decided it was time to circumvent Hitler's leadership altogether. He reached out to a Swiss diplomat to try to broker a deal in which basically he agreed to join the British and American-led Western allies in a fight against the Soviet Union. Hitler found out about it, though, and ordered Himmler stripped of his rank and arrested. Himmler managed to escape, but he ended up getting caught by the Western allies. It was then that Himmler committed suicide by poison. That leaves us with the last of the Nazi leadership that the movie mentions taking their own lives, Hermann Göring. It is true that he committed suicide. But again, the manner of his death was different than either Hitler or Himmler. While Göring was captured by the Western allies like Himmler, unlike Himmler, Göring was put on trial at Nuremberg. During these trials, Göring was one of many Nazis who defended themselves against four counts. They were count one, the common plan or conspiracy, count two, crimes against peace, count three, war crimes, and count four, crimes against humanity. Goring was found guilty of all four counts and condemned to be hanged. Goring entered a plea that he be shot instead of hanged. That plea was refused, and Goring was sentenced to be hanged with 10 other top Nazi officials. About two hours before the sentence was to be carried out in the early morning hours of October 16, 1946, Goring used a potassium cyanide pill he had hidden away in his hair pomade container. The final man mentioned during the opening text of the movie is, of course, one of the main characters in the movie, Adolf Eichmann. As you can probably guess, he was a very real person, and he was, as the movie says, an SS officer and the head of the Jewish Affairs Office. That means Adolf Eichmann was one of the primary organizers of the Holocaust. That's not to say Hitler, Himmler, and Goring weren't involved. They were. After all, Himmler was the head of the SS and one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany. But it was Eichmann who another top-ranking SS officer named Reinhard Heydrich called on to organize the deportation of Jews from occupied Poland as early as 1939. We learned about Heydrich, whose brutality earned him the nickname The Butcher of Prague, way back on episode number 12 of Based on a True Story when we covered the movie Anthropoid. Speaking of movies, let's head back to today's movie now, where we see an opening sequence that takes place in Austria in 1954. Peter Malkin, who is played by Oscar Isaac in the movie, knocks on a door. A man by the name of Werner answers, and almost immediately, two others with Peter drag the man away. Inside, Peter confronts the man's wife and children. She says her name is Annie, but Peter disagrees. No, your name is Vera. 
Looking down at her children, Peter tells her that her sons are Klaus and Dieter. Just then, a little girl steps from behind her mother's skirt. This family doesn't have two sons. They have one son and one daughter. Suddenly, a shot rings out. Realizing his mistake, Peter rushes outside to tell the others they have the wrong family. But it's too late. The man has been killed. Greg Hill's version of Moshi Tabor says something to the effect of, so what? He was a Nazi. I bet he was on someone's list. After this opening sequence, we hear Ben Kingsley's version of Adolf Eichmann talking about how they killed a man in Austria they mistook for him, for Eichmann. Although I couldn't find anything in my research to suggest this specific scene happened the way that we see in the movie, it is true that the search for Eichmann sent a lot of people down the wrong paths a lot of times since the end of World War II. And it would seem that some of those searches included talking to Vera Leibel, who the movie correctly shows as being Adolf Eichmann's wife. For example, in 2007, the CIA declassified a formerly secret document that explained that the United States' Counterintelligence Corps, or CIC, tried to track down Eichmann's whereabouts as early as 1946, so the same year as the Nuremberg trials. To quote from that document, According to one CIC source, Eichmann was believed to be living in Upper Bavaria, while his wife lived in Austria, as did his parents-in-law. CIC subsequently went and interviewed Vera Leibel, Eichmann's former wife in Altalse, in November of 1946. Leibel told the Army's investigator that she had not seen Eichmann since sometime in April 1945 when he visited her and her three children. It's worth mentioning that the CIA document calls Vera Leibel the former wife of Eichmann. The two were married in 1935, but I couldn't find any documentation to prove that they were ever divorced. And since the CIA seems to have been able to track down Vera rather quickly, I'm assuming they're using that terminology in the document because, at the time, they probably assumed that the two were no longer together, with Eichmann being on the run and all. That same document also mentions Rabbi Abraham Kamanovitz, who was from New York and in 1953 petitioned then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower to try and demand Eichmann's extradition. At the time, Kamanovitz thought that Eichmann was in the Middle East somewhere. Of course, we all know how secretive the CIA can be, so it's not like Israel's Mossad would necessarily know all that information at the time. Looking back on this from a historical lens, we know there were numerous sources in the early 1950s that claimed to have seen Eichmann in a variety of different places, Egypt, Italy, Syria, Germany, and so on. It's only with that historical look that we're able to know Eichmann's path from Germany to where he was ultimately captured in Argentina, or perhaps I should say recaptured. You see, soon after the war was over, Adolf Eichmann was captured by the U.S. military. He spent time in prison camps using fake papers he had made. That assumed name was Otto Eichmann. Now, it's important to keep in mind that at this time, he was imprisoned as any German soldier, a common German soldier. So it wasn't a maximum security prison or anything like that. And I should probably point out that even though we know him as Adolf Eichmann, his full name was Otto Adolf Eichmann. So Otto Ekman really wasn't that much of a change. It was probably not too surprising that it didn't take long for him to believe that his real identity was discovered. He managed to escape before they did anything about it, though, and fled to a small town in northern Germany. Using his contacts, he had more documents forged, this time with the name Otto Henninger. Well, I could never find any documentation to prove the Nuremberg trials played a part in his decision to leave Europe altogether. It wouldn't surprise me if they did. You see, this was 1946, about the same time that Eichmann's role in the Holocaust was starting to unfold at the Nuremberg trials, and he was mentioned in those trials. But leaving Europe would take more time. Using his connections again, Eichmann enlisted the help of a Nazi sympathizing bishop in Italy to get him a passport for Argentina. That passport was issued by the Italian delegation of the Red Cross of Geneva and was under another fake name, Ricardo Clement. Of course, that's the name that we hear in the movie. And so, on June 17, 1950, Eichmann left Germany and made his way to Argentina under the name Ricardo Clement. He landed in Argentina a little less than a month later on July 14th. Initially, Eichmann found work as Ricardo Clement for a government contractor, but 
then he started to establish more roots there. In 1952, Eichmann's family arrived in Argentina, and Eichmann himself got a job at Mercedes-Benz. Not to get too far ahead of our story, but eight years later in 1960, Eichmann and his family built the house at 14 Garibaldi Street in Buenos Aires that we see depicted in the movie. Meanwhile, he isn't in the movie at all, but in 1953, Holocaust survivor Simon Weisenthal received a letter that Adolf Eichmann had been seen in Argentina. In fact, it would be that tip that would eventually lead to Eichmann's capture as it helped authorities realize he was in Argentina instead of all of those other places. As a quick side note, I'm guessing that Simon Weisenthal was not included in the movie because Simon didn't actually go to Argentina on the mission himself. Speaking of the movie, let's head back to the movie's timeline now to find out how they identify Eichmann's location. We're in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in the year 1960. It's here that a young girl named Silvia Hermann meets a young boy named Klaus Eichmann. They hit it off, and before long, we see the two having dinner together with Silvia's father, Lothar. Over the dinner table, Lothar asks Klaus about his father. Klaus says he was in the SS during the war, but he was killed in the East. Now they live with Ricardo, their uncle. After a toast to Klaus's father, Lothar asks if he would recognize his name. Now, the camera cuts away before we hear Klaus's reply, but during the next scene, we find out he must have said Adolf Eichmann's name because at Mossad headquarters in Tel Aviv, Israel, they talk about getting a lead from Lothar Human about the whereabouts of Eichmann. As it turns out, Lothar was Jewish and spent some time in one of the concentration camps, Dachau. But he never told his daughter they were Jewish, instead raising her as a Catholic. So that's how the movie sets up how they got the lead on Adolf Eichmann. And the basic gist of this is true, but there's more to the story. Oh, and in Peter Malkin's book called Eichmann in My Hands, that was one of the sources for the movie, he mentions Lothar Hermann recalled the name Nicholas Eichmann as someone that his daughter had met, although the real Adolf Eichmann's oldest son was named Klaus. He didn't have a son named Nicholas, although some sources also suggest that Nick or Nicholas was a nickname for Klaus. But then again, other sources do say that Lothar's daughter, Sylvia, started dating Klaus, and so it's possible that maybe he was using an assumed name or the nickname, or maybe Lothar just simply misremembered the name. <laughs> That's nitpicking, though. One little tidbit that I found interesting in my research was that it wasn't only Klaus who bragged about his father's role in the war like we see in the movie. In fact, the real Adolf Eichmann did that himself. I couldn't find anything to indicate that the Mossad knew about this at the time, but we know now that for about four months in 1956, a Nazi journalist named Willem Sassen interviewed Eichmann about his time during the war. It would seem that Sassen was planning to write a biography about Eichmann, but those notes, tapes, and transcripts from the, that time ended up actually being used for articles in Life magazine in the United States and Stern magazine in Germany in 1960 after Eichmann was captured. As for Lothar Hermann, his role in Eichmann's capture was an important one, although there's a key difference in the movie that it doesn't really show that I'll circle back to here in a moment. Lothar was blind, like the movie shows, and he was a German Jew. He had spent time in the Dachau concentration camp. In fact, that's where he was blinded as a result of the beatings that he received there. As far as I could tell, one of the key reasons why he was in Dachau wasn't only because of being a Jew, but because he was a socialist. His arrest was for spying on Hitler's regime. And as I mentioned earlier, differing political views often meant that you'd end up in a camp, especially as the Nazis were rising to power. Escaping Dachau, Lothar left Germany before the war officially broke out when he moved to Argentina in 1938 after Kristallnacht. But Lothar had experienced enough of the Nazi party to recognize the name Eichmann years later when his daughter dated someone with that last name. But not right away. Heading back to the movie's timeline, Sylvia Hermann agrees to show the Mossad agents the Eichmann home. Sylvia makes up some story about trying to make up with Klaus after a fight. That's her reason for showing up at the Eichmann's home. Meanwhile, she leads the Mossad agents to their home, and we see one of the agents taking photos of Adolf Eichmann from afar. This is where I'll circle back to the key differences that I mentioned earlier. 
Even though the movie heavily implies the Mossad relied on Lothar's tip and used Sylvia as a kind of bait to get Adolf Eichmann's photo, it seemed that's not necessarily true. Although it is true that she went to Eichmann's house, but not necessarily the one that we see in the movie. So the movie was showing the timeline here as being after 1960. As we learned earlier, that would mean Eichmann's family would be living at the house on Garibaldi Street in Buenos Aires. Let's unravel what really happened. According to Neil Bascom's book called Hunting Eichmann, it was in 1957 that Sylvia noticed something in the newspaper that caught her eye. In an article talking about some of the Nazi trials, it mentioned the role of someone named Adolf Eichmann and how he was still at large. If you recall, earlier I mentioned that Eichmann's role in the Holocaust was brought up during the trials at Nuremberg. Probably one of the most prominent people who mentioned Eichmann's name was Rudolf Haas. He explained in great detail how Himmler had told him that he would be reporting to Eichmann and how he, Haas, started testing techniques for mass murder at Auschwitz. At least... That's what happened in the trial's testimony. I don't know how much of those details made their way into the actual article that Sylvia read, but the name Eichmann caught her eye because she had dated Klaus Eichmann. She showed the article to her father, and he reached out to the prosecutors mentioned in the article. When they replied, they asked for an address for the Eichmann. Now, that posed a little bit of a problem since Sylvia had never gotten Klaus's home address, even though they saw each other for a short period of time. He had only asked that if she were to write him that she'd do so through a mutual friend, which sounds like kind of a red flag right there, but maybe that's just me. After asking around a little bit, they managed to find it. 4261 Chakabuko Street, where the Eichmanns lived before moving to the house that they built at Garibaldi Street. And so it was at this house that Sylvia showed up to verify that it was indeed the Eichmann's residence. But just like we see in the movie, Adolf Eichmann never said his name was Adolf Eichmann to Sylvia here. He did admit to being Klaus's father, which would imply that his last name was also Eichmann. After what must have been an incredibly tense few moments as Sylvia was standing in the house of someone she thought might be a mass murderer, Klaus arrived at the house. We see something similar happen like this in the movie. And just like we see there, Klaus was surprised to find Sylvia there. And I don't know the specifics of what they said. If Sylvia had said something about it being an argument, I'm not really sure what that was. I couldn't find anything in the research there. But before long, Klaus walked Sylvia to the bus stop where she made her way home. Once she got there, she told her dad what had happened, and he relayed that information to the prosecutors from the article. Those people, in turn, relayed the information to the Mossad. Of course, The movie doesn't show that since that was in January of 1958, but the Mossad sent an operative named Emmanuel Tamor to Argentina to verify this lead. It was Tamor who said, nah, that's not Eichmann's home. Adolf Eichmann was a man of great importance. He wouldn't live in such a shabby house. Now, it wasn't until someone else sent along some proof that the same house that the Hermans had mentioned was indeed Eichmann's home that they started to really build out the rate. Now, this is where some of the sources get a little fuzzy on what exactly happened next. Some of the books and articles that I read while researching this story simply mention that we don't know for sure what that proof was. And maybe it's a secret that still is de- or hasn't been declassified yet. But as best as I can tell, it involves two more characters that we see in the movie, Fritz Bauer and Isser Harrell. Bauer is played by Rainier Rainiers, while Harrell is played by Lior Raz. Harrell was the head of the Mossad at the time, so when Tamor reported that it wasn't likely to be the Eichmann's home, he was prepared to drop the lead. Fritz Bauer was the attorney general of the then West German state of Hesse. As a Jew, he wanted to bring Nazis to justice. After Tamor's report, Bauer ended up going to Jerusalem himself in December of 1959 to deliver some proof. We don't really know what that proof was, but Bauer also claimed to have a former SS officer who could verify it. So, with that proof, Harrell was pressured to reopen the Eichmann case. Whatever that proof was, soon after this is when the Mossad started planning the raid, starting with getting proof that it actually was Eichmann. They wanted to verify this, uh, do double checks and triple checks, I'm sure. And that's when they found out that the Eichmanns had moved to their new home on Garibaldi Street. 
And that's where, just like we see in the movie, they figured out a way to snap photos of Eichmann in his backyard. It was actually Z. Aharoni, who is in the movie. He's played by Michael Aronov in the movie. And he used a camera hidden in a bag to take photos of Adolf Eichmann in his backyard. That happened on March 19th, 1960. And that was the proof they needed that it was indeed Adolf Eichmann. The mission was a go. Now, it's probably worth pointing out that after Eichmann was captured, Lothar Hermann tried to collect a $10,000 reward offered for information leading to the capture. He was denied initially. It wasn't until over a decade later in 1971 that he was finally paid, just three years before Lothar Hermann's death. Back in the movie, after identifying Adolf Eichmann, the team of Mossad agents managed to abduct him one evening. It happens after Eichmann gets off a bus and is walking down the road. Peter Malkin is walking in the other direction, and soon after passing by, Peter grabs Eichmann from behind and drags him into the ditch by the side of the road. Some of the other agents in a nearby car pull up and they force Eichmann into the backseat of the car before heading off. The movie does a pretty good job of showing how it happened even down to Oscar Isaac's version of Peter Malkin asking Eichmann if he had a moment in Spanish to catch him off guard. It was May 11th, 1960. The group of Mossad agents had been watching Eichmann's routines for about a month at that point and had decided it would be best to grab him after he got home from work in the evening. He took a bus and the bus stop was a little distance from his house, so that meant for a time Eichmann would be walking alone. Except... This time, something went wrong. When the bus Eichmann was always on arrived, he wasn't on it. The agents tried to figure out what to do. Had someone tipped Eichmann off to their plan? Should they abandon it? Should they continue? I'm sure there were plenty of questions that went through their minds. About half an hour after the bus that normally brought Eichmann home arrived, another one showed up and Eichmann got off. Malkin was the first to interact with Eichmann, as I mentioned earlier, and just like we see in the movie. Once Eichmann realized what was going on, he tried to flee, but two other Mossad agents helped Malkin wrestle Eichmann to the ground, and from there, they moved him to a nearby car where they had him on the floor under a blanket as they made their way to one of three safe houses that they had set up for this purpose. Going back to the movie, there's a problem that arises after they abduct Eichmann. They're in a safe house when they find out that LL, the airline that they used to get there won't send an airplane to get them without a signed document from Eichmann that he's willing to go to Israel. Of course, why would the Nazi architect of the Holocaust willingly go to Israel? Seems like an impossible task. But over time, Oscar Isaac's version of Peter Malkin is able to convince Eichmann to do exactly that. That is, well, let's call that partially true. I couldn't find anything in my research that would seem to back up the movie's plotline where the agents had to get Adolf Eichmann to sign a document before the airline would send an airplane to get them. That said, they did have Eichmann in the safe house for a total of nine days. The reason they waited, though, wasn't necessarily to get him to sign a document that would allow them to leave. Instead, it was for two reasons. First, they wanted to double-check, triple-check his identity, you know, to make sure they had the right person. Secondly, the head of the Mossad, Issa Harrell, was there at the safe house to oversee the operation, and he had received a report that Joseph Mengele was also in Buenos Aires. So they were looking for him and hoping that they could bring back Eichmann and Mengele back to Israel on the same flight. Mengele, of course, was also known by a nickname, Angel of Death, because of the horrible things he did as an SS doctor at Auschwitz. However, with all that said, I don't mean to make it sound like they didn't get Adolf Eichmann to sign a document that he was willing to return to Israel for judgment. It's just that that really wasn't the one thing that was holding them up. There were other aspects to it. For this part of the true story, though, I'll refer to an interview with Zvi Aharoni many years later where he took issue with the idea that Peter Malkin was the one who spoke to and convinced Eichmann to sign a document that he's willing to go back to Israel. And that's how we see it unfold in the movie. Here is a quote from that interview. In the safe house, I was the one who interrogated Eichmann and the only one who was allowed to talk to him. As Eichmann's interrogator, I was surprised to discover two things. First, how pathetic this man was who had conducted a vast and well-oiled system of mass annihilation. 
And second, that Eichmann had not insisted that his children change their name and that they were still called Eichmann. When I asked him about this, he said he could not force them to change their name. I also persuaded him to come to Israel for judgment and got him to sign a letter stating that he was willing to go to Israel. The general wording for the text was provided to me by Haim Coin, the Attorney General. Coin thought this would facilitate the trial and might be of help if we were caught before leaving Argentine territory. Zvi Malkin did not speak German and did not get Eichmann to sign the document stating that he was willing to go to Israel. I was the one who drew up the document with Eichmann carefully and thoroughly, and after it was formulated, I had him sign it. Avram Shalom can testify to that. The article then goes on to interview Avram Shalom, who confirms what Aharoni said, as well as Rafi Iten, who's played by Nick Kroll in the movie. The real Iten confirmed that it was only Aharoni who spoke to Eichmann in the safe house. It's a fascinating article filled with great interviews of the real people that I'll make sure to include in the resources for this episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. I would recommend giving that a read. Oh, and as a quick side note, during one of the conversations as Peter is shaving Eichmann in the movie, Eichmann says something to the effect of how he tried to save some Jews by sending them to Madagascar. He also mentioned how he negotiated with someone named Dr. Katzner in Hungary to trade trucks for lives. Eichmann goes on to call Katzner a hero, but, quote-unquote, your people shot him in cold blood. Your people, of course, being how Eichmann refers to the Jews. That is actually true. In August of 1940, Adolf Eichmann released a plan called the Madagascar Project. The plan called for a million Jews per year to be moved to Madagascar for the next four years. And it might have happened, too, if it weren't for the British. You see, right around that time was the Battle of Britain. What the Germans thought would be something that would force the British into a peace settlement ended up being a British victory. As a part of the Madagascar project, it relied on the British not being at war with the Germans since the British fleet had a decent grasp of the Atlantic waterways that they would use to transport all those people. And some sources that I saw in my research even suggested that the Germans wanted to use British merchant ships to help with the transport. But with the British defeating the Germans in the Battle of Britain, the Madagascar project was put on an indefinite hold, and it never came to fruition. That brings us to the brief mention of Dr. Katzner. That's another thing that really happened. Even the part where Ben Kingsley's version of Adolf Eichmann implies that Katzner who was a Jew who was shot by the Jews. Dr. Rudolf Katzner was a Hungarian Jewish journal and lawyer. In exchange for gold, money, and precious stones, he negotiated with Adolf Eichmann in 1944 at a point when the Nazis were shipping some 12,000 or so Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz each day. In return for payment, Katzner was able to save over 1,600 Jews on what we now know as the Katzner train. That train consisted of 35 cattle trucks that made their way to safety in Switzerland, arriving toward the end of 1944. And it is true that Katzner would end up being assassinated in Israel after being accused of being a Nazi collaborator. The Israeli government sued the newsletter who accused Katzner on his behalf, Apparently, what had happened was that Katzner learned of the mass murder in Auschwitz in April or May of 1944. The accusations against him said that instead of trying to warn a large number of Jews, he used that time to smuggle out a small number of people, including some wealthy who paid their own way to safety, as well as Katzner's own family and 388 people from the ghetto of his hometown. So basically, they accused Katzner of using the information about the mass murders of Auschwitz that he learned about in a self-serving manner to save people that he knew instead of the community at large. The government lost the case with the judge, determining Katzner had quote-unquote sold his soul to the devil. In March of 1957, Dr. Katzner was assassinated in Tel Aviv, Israel. The next major plot point in the movie happens when the Mossad agents sneak Adolf Eichmann out of the safe house. The way the movie shows this, they have to sneak him out of the back door because some Nazis are looking for him near the front door. We haven't really talked about them too much up until this point, but this group of Nazis are under the leadership of someone named Carlos Fuldner and includes Eichmann's son, Klaus. With the Nazis searching the streets for Eichmann and the agents wearing airline outfits as a disguise, they sneak Adolf Eichmann out of the back to a nearby car. 
Oh, and I didn't mention this, but their plan was to drug Eichmann and make him look like he's drunk. So that way he won't call out for help and they'll be able to get through uh, the guards at the airport. This whole scene is probably one of the biggest inaccuracies in the movie. It is true that the plan was for the Mossad agents to dress up as flight attendants and smuggle Eichmann out on an El Alf aircraft by drugging him. In the movie, the doctor that they bring along to administer the injection is a woman named Hannah Elian. She's played by Melanie Laurent in the movie. In truth, the doctor on the mission was a man by the name of Dr. Yona Elian. They changed him to a woman in the movie to kind of give him a love interest to Oscar Isaac's character, Peter Malkin. So a little bit of a change there. But it is true that Dr. Elian injected Adolf Eichmann with a sedative so they could pass him off as a drunken flight attendant to smuggle him onto the El Al plane and then out of Argentina. What isn't true is that Adolf Eichmann's son and some other Nazis in the area were searching for Eichmann and were so close to the agents and catching them that they had to sneak out the back door to avoid the Nazis at the front. It also isn't true that a Nazi in the air traffic control center hid the documents that they needed to take off the plane in a way that forced Malkin to deliver the documents and watch as the rest of the agents took off just as the Nazis arrived at the airport. With that said... There was a search for Eichmann after he went missing. His immediate family called local hospitals, thinking that something had happened to him. But they didn't call the police. While they did have some connections with Nazi sympathizers, kind of like the movie implies, actually a lot of their old Nazi friends had heard of Adolf Eichmann's capture, and so they fled, so they wouldn't be caught next. So there really wasn't much of a search for Eichmann. And in truth... The mission went off without a hitch. Again, like I said, that scene we see in the movie where there's a Nazi in the air traffic control that hides some documents, none of that actually happened. They took Eichmann to the airport, and the guards there did believe that he was a drunken flight attendant, so the sedative worked. Without any trouble, they were able to board the plane and leave. Although, the movie is correct to show that Malkin wasn't on board. Not because he had to deliver documents, but rather because he didn't even go to the airport with the rest of the agents. That wasn't even part of the plan. There were six operatives who went on the plane with Eichmann. Malkin and the other four operatives on the team stayed behind. They had to clean up the safe house, return cars that they had used in the operation, and so on. Once they did that, two of the operatives left by way of plane, while the other three, including Malkin, took a train to Chile, where they waited for a flight out of the country. There wasn't one scheduled for at least a week, so they just kind of waited there until they could get out out of the country and back to Israel. Meanwhile... The other operatives arrived in Israel with Eichmann on May 22nd, 1960. On May 24th, the Prime Minister of Israel made this announcement. I have to inform the Neset that some time ago, Israeli security forces found one of the greatest Nazi criminals, Adolf Eichmann, who, together with other Nazi leaders, is responsible for what they termed the final solution of the Jewish question. In other words, the extermination of six million European Jews. Adolf Eichmann is already in this country under arrest and will shortly be brought to trial. Anti-Semitism erupted in Argentina among Nazi sympathizers who had realized what has happened once this news broke. While the movie doesn't get into this side of it, in the weeks after Eichmann's arrival in Israel, the Argentine government appealed to the United Nations Security Council. There was a debate that ensued. On one side, the Argentine government claimed that the mission was a violation of Argentine law and their sovereignty. The Israeli representative said the men who captured Eichmann weren't working for the Israeli government. They denied that. They said that they were private citizens. The UNSC declared on June 23rd that Argentinian sovereignty had been violated. Then, after some negotiations on August 3rd, Argentina and Israel released a joint statement that basically said Israel would admit the mission was a violation of Argentine sovereignty, but they would both drop the dispute. At the very end of the movie, time passes a little bit. We see a date of 1961. We're in Jerusalem now as we see a few snippets of Adolf Eichmann's trial. He's sitting in a glass box in front of a bench of men. Behind those men is a massive audience watching the trial. Ghastly footage from the Holocaust is being shown for everyone, including Eichmann. We don't get a lot of the trial itself, but at the very end of the movie, there is some text on screen that explains what happened. According to the movie, Adolf Eichmann was hanged on June 1, 1962, after being found guilty of transporting millions of Jews to their deaths. 
It also says his trial was televised globally, making it the first time that eyewitness testimony of the Holocaust was seen by the world. His remains were cremated and spread in the sea so he would not have a final resting place. Since the focus of the movie is the mission to capture Eichmann and not really the trial itself, this is a very high-level overview, but generally speaking, that's pretty accurate. Immediately after his arrival in Israel, Adolf Eichmann spent the next nine months at a heavily fortified police station while he was questioned. They gathered this evidence that they could use in the trial, and during this time, Eichmann openly admitted to many things, but also insisted he was acting on orders. He was just doing what he was told to do. We can get a sense for the wording he used from a handwritten document by Adolf Eichmann, where he made a plea to the judge during his trial. This was made public in 2016, and here is a quote from that document, which was written by Eichmann on May 29, 1962. There is a need to draw a line between the leaders responsible and the people like me forced to serve as mere instruments in the hands of the leaders. I was not a responsible leader, and as such, do not feel myself guilty. He also said, It is also incorrect that I never let myself be influenced by human emotions. Specifically, after having witnessed the outrageous human atrocities, I immediately asked to be transferred. Also, during the police investigation, I voluntarily revealed horrors that had been unknown until then, in order to help establish the indisputable truth. Finally, he asked for a pardon. I am not able to recognize the court's rulings as just. And I ask your honor, Mr. President, to exercise your right to grant pardons and order that the death penalty not be carried out. His request for a pardon was denied. At the beginning of this episode, I mentioned the four counts that Hermann Goering was charged with during the trials at Nuremberg. On December 12, 1961, Adolf Eichmann was convicted on 15 counts of war crimes, crimes against humanity, membership in a criminal organization, and crimes against the Jewish people. Three days later, the sentence was handed down. It would be death by hanging. But Eichmann and his lawyers appealed the verdict, so it went to the Israeli Supreme Court. Even though we don't see any of this in the movie, there is something that we see happen in the movie that happened during this time. While the appeal was being heard, one of the people who wrote to ask for clemency or mercy on Adolf Eichmann's behalf was his wife, Vera. When it became obvious the appeal wouldn't go through, Vera asked the judge for something else. She asked to see her husband. In the movie, we see this as a request that Oscar Isaac's version of Peter Malkin promises to Adolf Eichmann in exchange for Eichmann signing the document at the safe house in Argentina. It didn't really seem to be how it went down, but the visit did happen. It would just seem that it was coordinated by Dov Yosef, the justice minister at the time. He determined that Israel would receive international criticism if they denied Vera's request. So, they let the meeting happen on one condition. That condition was that she would see him and then, within 24 hours, leave the country. They also made sure that the two were never alone so she couldn't slip him something that he could take to prevent them from administering justice, as the movie pointed out had happened for Hitler, Himmler, and Goering. Adolf Eichmann's appeal to the Israeli Supreme Court was officially denied on May 31st at 8 p.m. local time. A few minutes past midnight on June 1st, 1960, the sentence was carried out. As the story goes, his final words were, Long live Germany. Long live Argentina. Long live Austria. These are the three countries with which I have been most connected and which I will not forget. I greet my wife, my family, and my friends. I am ready. We'll meet again soon, as is the fate of all men. I die believing in God. However, one of the men who was involved in capturing Eichmann was also at the hanging. That would be Rafi Eitan, who's played by Nick Kroll in the movie. In 2014, Rafi explained that after Eichmann said those words, he uttered one more thing under his breath. Eichmann's final words were actually one last message of hatred directed at his Jewish captors. I hope that all of you will follow me. Just like the movie says, Adolf Eichmann's body was cremated and scattered in the Mediterranean Sea. If we head back to the movie, something we didn't really talk about much was Peter's sister and her three children. 
We see her throughout the movie in flashbacks and get the story that she was murdered by Nazis somewhere in the woods. Her name, we learned earlier when Malkin was talking to Eichmann about her, was Fruma. Then, in the final moments of the movie, she shows up again. Her showing up at the end of the movie is clearly something that Peter's imagining, but she kisses him on the cheek before going peacefully into the woods with her kids. It's sort of a peace, as if to say thank you for helping to bring the architect of her murder and the murder of millions to justice. Then, in the text at the end of the movie, it says that Peter kept the mission to capture Eichmann a secret from his mother until she was on her deathbed. When he finally told her about the mission, her reply was simply, I knew you wouldn't forget Fruma. Fruma was a real person, and she really was Peter Malkin's sister. His book is dedicated to her. It's also true that Peter told his mother about the mission on her deathbed. Even though everyone in the world knew about how Eichmann had been captured, they didn't know the details of it, they just know that it had happened. Like most top-secret missions, the details and who all was involved were still classified at that time. And while the exact words the movie mentions his mother saying aren't the ones that Peter Malkin has in his book when he told his mother about the capture of Adolf Eichmann, the basic idea is true. Fruma was never forgotten. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. If you want to learn more about the true story behind the capture of Adolf Eichmann, there are a number of books I would recommend, along with one very important thing to keep in mind for everything that we've talked about up until this point. First, start with Peter Malkin's book called Eichmann in My Hands, a compelling first-person account by the Israeli agent who captured Hitler's chief executioner. Since most of the movie is told through Malkin's eyes, that's clearly one of the primary sources for the movie, so it helps give a little bit more details. However, there are some other great books written about the mission. The head of the Mossad at the time, Isser Hara, we talked about him earlier, wrote a book about the mission called The House on Garibaldi Street. And Zvi Aharoni wrote a book about it called Operation Eichmann, The Truth About the Pursuit, Capture, and Trial. Lastly, there's another book called Hunting Eichmann, How a Band of Survivors and a Young Spy Agency Chased Down the World's Most Notorious Nazi by Neil Bascom. And that brings me to the very, very important thing to keep in mind. Each of those books differ on the accounts of what happened. They don't always agree. For example, earlier when I mentioned that Aharoni said that he was the only one who talked to Eichmann, well, Peter Malkin's book has some parts that have him talking to Eichmann like we see in the movie. Harrell's version of the story is a little bit different as well. I mean, overall, The main structure and elements are the same. Eichmann was captured in Argentina and taken back to Israel. But a lot of the details were different, and they differ between the differing accounts. An interview with Via Aharoni on Haaretz, the one that I mentioned earlier in this episode, also suggests that Aharoni has never forgiven Malkin for how he explained the way the operation went in his book. Here is a quote from the interview, and this is Via Aharoni. All the tales according to which Malkin held intimate conversations with Eichmann and drank wine with him are the fruit of his imagination. It's too bad Boscombe didn't bother to check his facts properly. So you can see there he's talking about both Malkin and Neil Boscombe's book. Rafi Aten never wrote a book about the mission, but in that same interview, he said, The most authentic book is the one by Issa Harrell, though it also contains a few fairy tales. So which one is true? Or is the truth somewhere in between? I'd probably venture to guess it's the latter. The truth lies somewhere between these different accounts, and that's why I'd recommend reading all of them. Of course, I'll have links to all those books and plenty more resources over on the page for this episode at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. Adolf Eichmann's fake name at the time of his capture was Ricardo Clement. Number two, Klaus Eichmann dated a half-Jewish girl who helped in Adolf Eichmann's capture. Number three, Adolf Eichmann committed suicide in prison before he could be hanged. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number two. Klaus Eichmann dated a half-Jewish girl who helped in Adolf Eichmann's capture. That is true. As we learned, that girl was Sylvia Hermann, whose father, Lothar, remembered the name Eichmann from his time at the Dachau concentration camp before the war. 
Next is number one. Adolf Eichmann's fake name at the time of his capture was Ricardo Clement. That is also true. Even though Eichmann used multiple fake names as he fled Germany in the wake of the Third Reich's collapse, the name he used to enter Argentina was Ricardo Clement. So that's the one he had when he was captured in Argentina years later. That means the lie is number three. Adolf Eichmann committed suicide in prison before he could be hanged. As we learned, Eichmann was hanged just after midnight on June 1st, 1960, which would be just a few hours after the Israeli Supreme Court denied his request for an appeal. However, some of the other Nazi high command like Hitler, Himmler, and Goering did escape their own trial and or justice by committing suicide. That brings us to an end of this episode. Before we go, there's one last thing I think would be nice to do. I've never really heard a podcast share the stats for each episode, and I'm a big fan of being as open and honest as possible, so I figure, why not? Maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating podcasts like mine, maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, here are the final stats for the creation of this episode. Today's episode took a total of 24 hours to create and cost $38.12 in out-of-pocket expenses. Now, it's probably worth pointing out that time and cost is only for this one episode. And as I, you know, I'm mentioning that it took 24 hours to create. And as I'm recording this, of course, I still need to go through the process of editing the recording that I'm currently creating. So there is a little bit of estimation there on the editing time that it takes uh, post the writing and recording. Fortunately, the editing time is the least of the times, and the writing and researching takes the most for an episode like this. Now, that time and cost doesn't include any of the ongoing costs, things like the podcast hosting, the website hosting costs, hardware costs, the cost for the you know, microphone, the computer, the software costs that I'm recording on, all of that. It also doesn't account for any of the time outside of writing, researching, or producing this one episode. So the time to set up the microphones and the software and all that doesn't include any of that time. If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode of Based on a True Story over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a way of saying thank you, you'll get access to a ton of bonus content on the producer's feed. For example, we've looked at how fictional movies depict history, like the accuracy of the pirate code that we saw in Disney's The Pirates of the Caribbean, or the way that the different Back to the Future movies use history and future technology. Well, the future at the time that those movies were created, that was in 2015. So and the movies weren't created then, but that was the future. The future time was 2015. So we'll look at how well it did predicting that future. Once again, you can learn more about that over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. In the meantime, if you'd like to add to the story, hop onto the Based on a True Story Facebook group, or you can reach out to me directly where I'm on Twitter at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Until we chat again, thanks so much for listening, and bye for now.